Happy hump day, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode. I'm Piper Halp, and I'll be your moderator today. The purpose of this webinar series is to raise the bar with like-minded professionals in the Midwest hemp community by sharing reliable and trustworthy information so that we can all prosper in this new emerging market. This is a volunteer effort and definitely a labor of love led by the Hemplet Farms team, um, Purdue University Extension Services, with a shout out to Marguerite, <laughs> Newton County Soil and Water Conservation District, Northwest Indiana Forum, and the Midwest Hemp Council, which is the premier association representing the hemp industry right now. So I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Christy Apple, president of Crop Scout. It's not how much Christy knows that makes her so special, it's how passionate she is about growing quality crops that make her an extraordinary ordinary person in the hemp industry. Uh, Crop Scout Christy, as she's known on social media and on farms, will bring timely practical coaching on how to give a positive outcome for your farm's hemp venture. Picking up where Petrus and I left off um, with our seedling and clone propagation PowerPoint, this is getting your crop started. Christy will share her experience in how to keep your crop growing once it's in the ground. Um, leaning on her agronomy field experience, she will be breaking down some critical problems customers face growing um, and simplifying the fertility, soil health, and pest management concepts that you'll be facing. So with that said, I'll hand it over to Christy. Um, and Christy, you could take it from here. Thank you so much for that introduction, Piper. As Piper mentioned, I'm Crop Scout Christy. I am a crop consultant working with all kinds of specialty crops all throughout the Midwest. And over the last two years, I've had an ex the opportunity to go really deep with um, cannabis and industrial hemp producers to get a feel for what are the key challenges, how do we navigate through these things. And so our talk today is gonna be kind of two segments. One of them is preparing your soil and getting everything ready up to the planting and then our second half of our talk will be more about planting what to expect in the field and that type of thing. So I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quick. Make sure you take notes and shoot Piper those questions so we can get everything answered that you might have today, okay? <clears throat> so we're gonna talk um, a little bit of, to define how soil health plays a role here. Um, considering where our roots are going to be growing in the field, this is a very different production system when we're doing a field scale versus doing an indoor scale. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the plant and the soil microbe interactions, and then how do we suit our field goals to match our cultural practices or, or systems that we already have in place. So if you've ever heard me talk before, which I'm sure some of you have, um, I have developed what's called a hemp plan whiteboard. I like this whiteboard approach because it gives us a, you know, just kind of some key things that we should be focusing on, on certain, during certain seasons of the year as we prepare to be a successful hemp farmer. I want to make an assumption today, and hopefully I'm correct in this assumption, that if you're planning to plant within the next two weeks, that you probably have already gotten a soil sample. And hopefully you'll be able to develop a nutrient management plan based on that soil sample. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the nutrient needs of a cannabinoid production system and how do we achieve those nutritional needs for the plants. Um, but I was also hoping that you got a heavy metals test along with that as well. That's something you typically have to ask for individually. And I always get a ton of questions about what heavy metals should I sample for? What should I be looking for? What are the ranges that all of this information and what we like to use as a rule of thumb because those technically speaking is very difficult to know whether this plant will actually pull heavy metals out of the soil or not. We've seen it utilized in remediation scenarios. And so the answer is we know that it can, but we don't know that it always will. And so the EPA has certain guidelines um, for these heavy, specific heavy metals that we're really queuing in on. And we can talk about that um, on another call. In fact, that soil sampling conversation is probably a two hour presentation in and of itself. I'm hoping you've secured your seeds, your plant material, whether that be clones or seedlings, and you have that in your hands. Um, and then also we wanna finalize our field preparation. So we wanna make sure we're in the right field um, that's gonna suit those needs. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, at, through my presentation here. So the site preparation is gonna be really important and we wanna talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about tillage, ground fertility, and whether or not we're gonna use raised beds or direct seeding and how those, all of those things kind of play a role in how this works. So let's just talk about the soil dynamics first. The truth is most soils can supply at least a sum of the nutrient requirements, right? 
we don't have to fertilize the forest. It naturally does it on its own. But when we have fields that have been cultivated over the years and don't have the super dynamic biological uh, uh, act to activity going on, sometimes we need to supply some of that. And there's good ways to do that, and there's better ways to do that. And we'll talk a little bit about those. And then I want to kind of challenge you too um, to continue doing ongoing assessments for that soil for that soil information, um, whether that be annual, um, you know, yearly soil sampling to make sure what we're putting out there is in is it adequate and if it's the right kind of material, and working with our soil's nature. Soils have all kinds of different um, properties, physical, biological, and chemical properties that affect how every single thing that we apply or plant or do to that field affects it. So it's a very complex system. We don't just shove the plants in the ground and, and hope for the best. Um, we're affecting a system that naturally lives there, and so we need to adapt to that or figure out a way to, um, to bring those two worlds together. And I always like to take the approach of an environmental stewardship um, position. I want to be being responsible with my nutrient applications. I want to put the right material in the right place at the right time with the right source. Just because I can get nitrogen through one source doesn't mean it's right for my soil textures or the soil dynamics that exist out there. And that's something that a little bit of coaching with an agronomist that understands soil textures and soil physical properties can help you um, to determine. Also at the right rate, uh, in, in some situations, it makes sense for us to apply all of the nutrition ahead of the planter or ahead of the transplanter. In other situations, it makes more sense for us to apply some of it there and then as a risk management strategy, apply some later in the season when our plants might be hungry for it again. And so kind of doing smaller doses multiple times. And then also in the right placement, sometimes we can apply nutrients in a transplant solution or we can foliar apply, we can apply to the soil and incorporate that. So all of these things are really connected and getting this right will help us be better stewards of our land so that we can continue to cultivate into the future. Also, there's this really interesting connection between the way that the soil microbes interact with the plants that you plant, that interact with the sunlight and the, the oxygen, um, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, everything that's in the atmosphere as well. So these things are very intermingled. Um, and I don't want to go into too much detail. I can really geek out on this part because this is what I love so much. Um, but I will just suffice it to say, everything that we do to our plant, we're doing something to the soil, whether that be positive or negative, and all of the creatures that call soil home. So I just want to caution you to make sure you're keeping that as a high priority whenever we're choosing what products we're applying and how we're feeding and how we're managing for pests um, and how we're tilling the soil as well. Because it's very important for the plants to have good soil quality and good soil solution. Um, and, and our plants aren't gonna be able to feed if we don't have root growth, in the, the root growth that we need to access things like water and nutrients. A majority of that comes through the roots. A small amount of, of nutrition can be absorbed through the leaf tissue, but that's certainly not a primary strategy. So we wanna make sure that our soil quality is in good shape for us to be able to maximize these teeny tiny root hairs where everything enters. The plant has a waste system. So when it takes something in through these super tiny little root hairs, it will translocate all through the plant and then be exhausted out of the larger root systems that are on those plants. So we need a combination of both and rooting and shooting is gonna be the way that we get to that, um, especially in the early part of that plant's life when we transplant or when we first plant that seed. Also, I wanna kinda of just chat with you briefly about the necessity of, of plant elements um, or, or nutrition for plant life. So the plant's primary function is to survive into the next generation. It has a whole series of systems that cause it to do everything to exist for another generation. And one of those primary functions of that plant is going to be um, capturing light and through the process of photosynthesis, creating um, sugars and carbohydrates to generate plant material and reproductive material so that it makes it to the next generation. And what our, our science has come to discover is there's some key elements that are essential for this process to take place. These are not suggested elements for plant life, but essential. And so it's important for us to know through that soil sample, if we have adequate amounts of these things, and if we do need to supplement that in some ways, 
or multiple ways. Um, also, to understand that the plant takes up certain nutrients in different quantities through the course of its life. So although we, we need all of these things that you see on your screen, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, mag, sulfur, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, moly, and a tiny bit of chlorine, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they all are applied in the same quantity. Certain functions in certain seasons of the plant's life, it goes through these different hunger cycles. You're not going to feed baby formula to a teenager in the same way you wouldn't feed a Big Mac to a baby. We want to put the right material, the right nutrition in front of those plants at the right timing that suits where they're at through their growth stage. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the second half of, the, of our talk today to help us understand how that works. So one of the important things that we really should take into consideration when we're talking about soil conditions is before we ever apply any products to the field, that we first understand what our pH looks like. And pH is a really, really big limiter for a lot of different things in the soil. It's also a huge enabler. So what we need to do is find this sweet spot of soil pH where our cannabis plants, our hemp plants want to thrive. From what our understanding is today and from years of documentation in the past, really that 6.2 to 6.9 soil pH is where we can, first of all, access a good majority of the nutrition that it needs to grow, but also for root exploration and for a balance of, of metabolic functions to operate correctly. So these things, as I talked about earlier, are very interconnected. So one of the chemical properties of the soil can actually affect some of the physical properties of the plant. So you see how these things are kind of intermingled in this way? I just want, it, it's a very complex topic, but I just want to talk about that briefly so you know. Now, if you've selected a field that is outside of this ideal pH range, that's not necessarily a failure um, before we even start, but recognize you may need to amend that soil and, with some type of product to help change that pH. That is a slow process. It takes a lot, of, a lot of microbial engagement. It takes water and it takes application and soil incorporation to do those things. So if your soil pH is out of that range and you have starts sitting on your porch already ready to get planted, that's, you, you may be setting yourself up to have to adapt to that in season which can happen, but we're going to probably be prone to nutrient deficiencies very quickly. It's going to be prone to stress oxidization very, very quickly. Um, so if we, we have to really monitor and measure that a little bit differently. If, however, on the other side of that, if you have a field that is in that range, chances are your plan is going to be able to adapt and roll with the punches very, very good. Um, throughout the course of the growing season. Um, so let's take a look at, um, you know, at that soil pH and just keep a close eye on how we want to manage that. Um, a lot of our, you know, different, different nutrients have a different electrical charge um, and, and that affects how they move through the soil profile and move into the plant. And so the products that we choose to use for our amending, say if we have to move our soil pH, for example, and lime it, we have several different products to choose from get some good coaching on which material is going to work the best for you. It may need more magnesium. It may need more higher calcium products. Um, if we're driving pH down, we're going to need an elemental sulfur material to do that. So those are, those are uh, things that we can have a more intimate discussion out, you know, off, off camera after the webinar here. But I just want to touch on that because you can make change to those things. You just have to do it the right way, okay? Also, I wanted to just throw at you, in just a gram of soil, which is about the size of a sugar packet, there, there are so many microbes there, and, and their functioning to us is, is, in some situations, unknown yet, um, because there are so many different um, kinds, families, species, races of soil microbes. Um, but what we do know is that when we have uh, a prolific soil microbial activity, we can sometimes elicit these plant responses that actually help to resist diseases. So when we have a healthy soil system, we almost always have a healthy plant system and fruiting system. You're going to hear me use the word fruiting frequently today because when we are growing for cannabinoids, we truly are producing fruit. We're growing biomass to extract for 
CBD, CBG, CBN, whatever your goal is there. Um, and so what we're trying to do is feed that plant and treat it like a fruiting crop. And so we're going to want floral material developed correctly. We're going to want water accessible through the course of the growing season and, and the, the typical things that we would want to have for a normal fruiting system. <clears throat> so tapping into this, you know, billions of microbes in the soil is going to be a really critical part of that. Um, so I want to just, just kind of touch on this principle here. Um, this, this barrel that you see in front of you is kind of an interesting little depiction of the law of minimums. So say we get our soil tillage correct. Say we get at, at ample water in an appropriate amount of light, but we have some weaker link in our system somewhere else. We could be hemorrhaging yield and really not even know it because the barrel still looks full. But because we're short in one place, it kind of presents this unidentified threat or what we like to call hidden hunger. We see this in a lot of different cropping systems where we can't quite put our finger on it because we're not really looking at the bigger picture. So my approach to hemp agronomy is kind of keep an eye for that bigger picture. Keep your mind focused on producing fruit and all of the, the things that are going to challenge us while we're getting to that fruiting stage or while we're finishing our fruit and maturing our flowers and accumulating CBD. So we want to just watch for those low staves in the barrel and, and make sure that we're, we're doing things in balance and not reacting very strongly in a pendulum type of way. We want to stay um, small steady movements through the course of the growing season so that we can keep on target and stick with our, our helping our plants to produce the fruit that we're looking for. So those are really important things that we're, you know, that I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we as we do this. But we're going to talk a little bit about the ground fertility and some of our planting considerations. So let's talk about really technically the soil management piece of this. We already talked about soil sampling with the heavy metals test. That gives us one important piece of information. That's where we are starting from. And if we understand how many parts per million we have of potassium, phosphorus, calcium, mag, what ratios certain things are in in our soil, that can help us to develop a nutritional program to complement that. That may tell us we have extremely high phosphorus in the soil or high potassium in the soil, that we, we would have to adjust our nutritional program for that. Um, and, and so that's really important for us to recognize. Um, you don't just buy a bag of, of granular fertilizer and, and spread it and hope for the best. You may not need everything that's in that bag. It'd, be, it'd make more sense economically and from an environmental stewardship perspective to do this on a more prescription basis. We don't expect you to do those things by yourself. That's why people like myself exist, um, so that we can help you know, partner with you to, to develop programs that make sense for your farm. So let's talk quickly about tillage. Tillage considerations are um, kind of a hot topic, and there are some really interesting perspectives and almost religious belief systems surrounding certain tillage practices. You may be a no-tiller, you may be a conventional tiller, you may be, you may identify as some other, um, you know, till, tillage blending of those practices. I'm not ever going to ask you a question like, are you a no-tiller or are you a conventional till? Because there's just too many details in there. What I'm going to ask you is, what are you equipped to do? What tools do you have access to right now? And what do you feel is best or what are your goals for your farm? So if you're trying to move to a completely regenerative agricultural system, then we're probably going to try to adapt to some of the no-till type procedures. If that, is, if that isn't your goal and you want to have some mechanical tillage for weed control or for incorporating nutrition products that we apply, um, you know, we're, we'll adapt to a program that looks like that. So your tillage considerations are both environmental stewardship oriented, but also cultural practice oriented. If you're planning to um, lay plastic down with a raised bed, you're going to need to do some tillage to create a seed bed. We need to have the soil in a condition that is soft enough to allow roots to penetrate, but firm enough to allow us to put our plug into it and it to stand up properly. Um, so we want to take a look at those things. Productivity is another question that I often get. How do I know if my soils are productive? What's been growing on there the last couple of years? Those are some important questions that I would ask. 
Um, has it been cropped for the last couple of years? If so, what crops, what rotation of those cropping systems? Has manure been applied? Um, has it been incorporated? What types of things have taken place here to cause that? Or if we have some field yield history, it may not be for hemp, but if you had corn in that field once upon a time and it did very, very well and it generated a lot of bushels, you may have a higher productivity soil. That's a good thing. Hemp likes higher productivity soils. It generally speaks to the soil texture and um, in the soil quality and microbial health there too. So the healthier soils are when we put the hemp into the ground, the healthier it'll be on the other end of that crop, but your hemp will also thrive um, even more so in those types of environments. It does not like wet feet. Hemp plants like moisture, but not wetness. There is a ton of risk of pathogens entering into the plant systemically when we have prolonged dampness in the soil. And so when we're watering in our irrigation considerations, um, if you're, you have the luxury of being able to irrigate, it's gonna be small doses frequently versus large quantities once, a, once in a while. Um, if you're not in a situation where you have irrigation access, you're going to be reliant upon the rain. And so in those situations, we can't change how much Mother Nature is going to give us. And, um, but considering your soil texture, soils that are naturally well-drained tend to be loamier and sandier soil textures. It doesn't mean that a clay soil is completely out of the question. In fact, I've seen very productive clay soils. Um, but I would see if you could find a field that has tile so that if we do have these strange rain events like that are seeming to become the norm recently, um, you'll be able to get that water away in time so that we don't have to have the threat of or the risk of, of pathogens there, as well as the soil microbial activity going anaerobic on us, which means they're not going to be sharing nutrients with your plant at that point. They're going to be busy doing other functions and the, the microbes that do the nutrient sharing with the plant are either going to die or become um, very seriously impaired for a period of time. So those are, those are some really important um, considerations there on your soil management. And we just spent a little bit of time talking about pH there. So this is important for us to know that, um, you know, as we go through the growing season, our plants are going to have these these building needs. We're going to have more biomass growing continually throughout the season, so we're going to need more nutrition available later in the summer as, these, um, as the growth progresses. Um, so we really want to match the nutrient applications to suit the growth stage and what's taking place physiologically in that plant. Um, and there's a little bit of science there um, behind that. We'll talk about that in our second half. But for now, let's just briefly talk about the fertility um, for the hemp. So one thing I would strongly caution you against is luxury applications of N, P, and K. Um, we have some guidelines as far as how, how many pounds to apply, and that's pounds of actual nutrients. That's not pounds of product. So um, just be, be cautious when, you're, when you walk into a co-op or the farm store and say, I need X amount of pounds of something. You need to recognize that the actual consumer products that we use to apply may not match what we're talking about here in terms of actual nutrients. So. Avoid luxury um, applications of MP and K. That can cause a whole myriad of problems. It can cause leggy plants. It can cause other nutrients to tie up. We want to really be careful um, on things like nitrogen later in the season releasing um, and causing potentially some THC drift, which is going to render our, potentially render our crop um, outside of the guidelines for legality. Um, and if you have access to, um, you know, Fertility through drip tape. Um, that's an excellent way to do small continual doses. And it also allows you to move the dial very minimally, but very strategically. Um, if you don't have access to that, we have other options. And that would be foliar feeding, meaning you're actually applying a water solution of nutrients to the leaf tissue. And it is in a form that can be absorbed through the leaf tissue. It's very important that what we're applying to the leaf tissue is in a form that the plant can take in through the stomates, um, which are the little mouths on the cells <clears throat> where they're going to actually take in things from their leaf tissue. Um, and there's also really important considerations when we're applying things um, to the plant, like nitrogen, for example. Plants have um, these, these proclivities to take in nutrients with another nutrient and have more efficiency out of it. For example, um, hemp really likes to take in nitrogen along with sulfur. So for every, say, 10 pounds of nitrogen that the plant can take in, we should be supplying about three pounds of elemental sulfur to that 
to have more efficiency out of both the nitrogen and the sulfur and to have a more robust vegetative growth. So this is, would be early season applications when we're in the vegetative season of that plant. On this next slide has some kind of ranges here um, as far as how many pounds of these nutrients we would need. Um, now I have compiled this. These are, these are my recommendations that I've gotten really comfortable with, but this certainly isn't the gospel, okay? This is important for us to understand that the soil supplies some of these without us intervening at all. So just because it requires 90 pounds doesn't mean that we need to supply 90 pounds. It makes more sense um, like I said, from an environmental stewardship standpoint, um, for maximizing the plant physiology standpoint, and from an economic standpoint, for us to supply maybe 50 to 75% of the total nutrition needed and leave a balance of that for in-season feeding, where we can tweak that, like I said, move that dial slowly, but strategically. So here you see phosphorus, potassium. Um, you can get this in different ways, um, and I have my... my um, preferences on how to achieve those. Um, but here we're going to talk a little bit about calcium, mag, and sulfur. And these are really, really critical for us to spend some time talking about. Um, these particular nutrients have extremely important roles to play and things like um, stalk strength, cell wall strength, um, we want to hold branches up at the end of the season. We want huge colas to develop. We need big, strong branches to be able to hold them up so we're not harvesting mud bud. Um, so calcium plays a really critical role in that. And in fact, last season, we saw some splitting of those bottom branches away from the primordial stem because we had calcium deficiencies early on in the plant life. So I really work hard to manage for calcium within the plant during the growing season to maximize that. Magnesium plays a very pivotal role in the plant's immune system functions. Calcium plays a role in that as well, but mag is very critical um, that we, that we not go deficient, susceptible to diseases that will hurt us later on in the season. Um, and sulfur speaks directly to things like flavor, fragrance, and terpene development. And so when we think about the roles that calcium, mag, and sulfur have, from a nutritional standpoint, we are literally altering the trajectory of your whole entire cropping program based on these limiters. In fact, I personally feel that a plant can go shy on nitrogen before it should ever go shy on, on calcium. I am more comfortable doing a very minimalist program on NP and K and a very robust program on calcium, mag, and sulfur. So but that's per my personal experience. I see that also in other cropping systems um, that we're growing fruit and um, in translating that experience into hemp. We've seen a really, really solid response to that. So I just, that's where I'm coming from with that. And I actually like to use um, some compost blends to supply some of these materials um, for the soil health component, but also in the efficiency and getting it into the plant. Um, so I don't have exact numbers here to give you on how much the plant's going to take in of calcium, mag, and sulfur. That is going to be a function primarily of your soil dynamics. And those are, those are big, giant topics, okay? So I don't want to get down the rabbit hole too much on that today. Um, but having a solid base program, I have really had success foliar feeding calcium, mag, and sulfur, and um, doing a good job with that um, in a supplemental scenario. So you have options to get it out there, okay? So don't get too afraid of that. Um, as I mentioned, I actually really am comfortable using some different compost materials to achieve some of these nutrient needs. I, I have farmers that are using tr traditional conventional granular fertilizers to achieve this and a complementary foliar program. I have hemp farms that are using exclusively compost um, if they're trying to operate within the realm of staying completely organic compliant. Um, and so these composts provide us with really excellent tools and balanced nutrition to get us where we need to be. Usually looking for about a ton and a half to two tons, depending on what your soil samples are calling for. And that should amend soil. It should supply the nutrition for that, that season. And compost goes through a whole series of breakdown processes through the course of the growing season as our soil temperatures increase 
certain soil microbial populations start to get busy on breaking those nutrients down and making them plant available. And so that has compost can sometimes have a slow release effect as well, which is an excellent tool to help support that later season feeding we need without having to do an additional application into the season. Um, here again, I'm talking about 50, maybe 70, 75% of your total nutrition from this direction and, um, and doing a really balanced feed in that way. Um, I was able to work with a company here in Michigan um, to um, develop a, a really great blend specifically for hemp. And um, I'm really happy to, to share that they have that material is available. Um, Ag Marvels, um, agmarvels.com, you can, you can get in touch with them and they can, they can help you out regardless of where you're at. We, we should be able to help you out there. Um, so the, one of the, the, one of the key benefits I'll say to the compost as we've talked about is feeding the crop but there's a whole series of other benefits to introducing compost into your system improving soil organic matter in your ability to transfer nutrients back and forth um, improving soil aggregate stability um, inc increasing water holding capacity improving your productivity predictability is really critical and there's all these different things that kind of play a role in that that are all very tightly intermingled as we had talked earlier um, so I really am comfortable with compost in that way and a or a blend of compost plus conventional nutrition to get you where you want to be and you know just it, it contributes carbon to digest soil residues it, it helps to restructure the um, soil organic carbons in in the soil itself um, so we really have a, a lot of benefits there and it's sometimes very difficult for us to get adequate phosphorus and potassium um, in a system that isn't using conventional fertility and compost allow us to do that. So I, I'm pretty happy with that. So I'd like to stop there um, because that's a lot of content and I'm sure you guys have questions for me. Um, so I'm going to flip the screen back over to Piper and we can um, do some Q&A. Well, thanks, Christy. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like on timing wise, it looks like we're kind of running short on timing. Um, so I might actually cut this question and answer period short. Just out of curiosity, what, um, what type of services do you offer so that everyone can know what you can provide? That's a great question. So um, I have a consulting business, Crop Scout Christie Consulting, um, where I focus on nutritionals, um, pest management, and soil preparation um, for different cropping systems, hemp being one of those. Um, so that would be one of the services um, groupings that I offer. I also work for TMAC Agro USA. They're a crop nutrient uh, manufacturing company. Um, we're locator based out of um, France and um, we touch cropping systems in um, 100 plus countries um, and we have a focus on um, sustainability and excellence in crop nutrition using tools that um, are derived out of the sea and seaweed extracts to improve um, the availability of nutrients. So I have, you know, kind of two roles there and the services that I provide are both um, consultative as well as uh, sales oriented there. Okay, and then I'll just do one more question and then I'll save the rest for the end. Um, a private question came in. How do you decide what type of starts to put in your ground, whether it be seed, seedlings, clones, etc.? So that is an excellent question, and I will get to you in the, in the next segment of our talk. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to start off with that, so that, that excites me. It's a perfect segue. Perfect. So let's segue in and you can start it up. Okay. A big shout out for whoever just set me up perfectly there. Thanks, guys. All right. Is my screen not sharing? Can you guys see my screen okay? I can see the questions. Okay. You might need to share one more time. Yep. Okay. My slides aren't in beyond sync, so I'm not sure what's going on there. All right. Okay. So the second half of our talk today, um, we are going to talk about getting planted slash transplanted, some pest management, and preparing for some in-season challenges. Um, no doubt you're going to have lots of different challenges. And so right now we're going to talk specifically about transplanting. And I'm going back to my whiteboard here um, because it just is a great visual for us to say, okay, this are, these are things we need to start you know getting engaged on so we'll start off 
with how to choose or, or selecting what we need to, what, what kind of planting system we need. I had several clients last year actually do some direct seeding where they used their corn planters or a precision planting setup and were able to direct seed into the ground. The seedlings, uh, the seeds themselves need to be no, no deeper than half an inch at the very most. Um, you need to have warm soils. You need to have soil temperatures um, above 55. Um, I would prefer to see closer to 60. Um, on a consistent basis before we get out there. Otherwise, it's gonna slow your germination process. Um, we, last year, we had a ton of rain and one of my farms here in Michigan that direct seeded, and they actually had to replant two weeks later. And at the end of the season, you would never have known where they had to replant versus where they had originally planted because those plants caught up really, really quickly. So don't let that scare you. Um, if this is what you're equipped to do, go for it. Um, I like to see um, seeds in the ground or seedlings in the ground. Um, and we'll talk about some planting spacing ratios a little later to talk as far as how many seeds per acre. I like to see somewhere around 2,800 seeds per acre. Um, we do need to expect that some of those seeds aren't going to make it. And so by the time we we take out for germination, um, and then if we eventually have any males in season, we may need to call um, you're going to, you know, be somewhere in that hopefully 2,000 to 2,500 final stand range in terms of seeds per acre. Um, so oil conditions do need to be right though. Um, so don't go plant it in a super wet field. Don't don't plant it right ahead of a pounding rain. Um, you're not going to have the outcome that you had hoped. If you're going the clone route, I would highly highly recommend if you've already purchased clones. Um, and they've been delivered to your farm, pull one or two out of the tray and observe what they look like. This, these two pictures right here are actually plant material that was delivered to one of my clients last year, and they were expected to plant these. As you can see, there is a root, a singular root. That is not acceptable. Those clones, although we did play around with it, we could absolutely not get more than 20% of those to stay alive. We struggled and struggled and eventually they all died off within two weeks of planting. Um, I saw a lot of this last year, people doing very quick, rapid cloning, trying to just sell clones. Um, that was a, a horrible practice and I really, I encourage you to reject any kind of plant material that comes to your farm that looks like this. I really do like a, a seedling transplanted um, because it has had a chance to develop a root system, which is its mechanism to not just hold it up in the ground once we plant it. It's its mechanism to manage water, um, access nutrients, and, um, and to manage stress as well. So um, make sure your clones have a nice root mass. Um, the clones have a little bit more fibrous roots that are, are kind of more lateral around the base of that clone stem, um, whereas a seedling, you're gonna see a tap root and tons and tons of um, ancillary roots off of that. So there, there isn't necessarily one better the other than the other in terms of what's gonna take better, but in cloning, one of the benefits there is if you have a COA, which I highly recommend you get a certificate of analysis of origin for this plant material, that it is feminized. Um, for your CBD production so that you can have the best outcome possible. Clones have a, a stronger likelihood of, of feminization and um, reduced risk of herming later in the season. Whereas your seedlings, we can sometimes still run into that, um, but those are just some lookouts on both of that. Hopefully that answered that question a little bit. I'm not gonna tell you to do one or the other. I've seen success in all of these different systems. I want it to suit your cultural practices um, and, and, and what you're set up to do more so than say, I really like this over that one, okay? I would make some recommendations though, as far as how to have a better um, you know, catch, shall we say, with whatever it is that we do. Um, I really like to do a root stimulant, um, root dip um, type of, of application when we're transplanting. There's, uh, these are two pictures um, that you see on your screen here. Actually, are just some trials that I did last year with, um, with a farm that wanted to try a root stimulant that we used. They had really great success with it. And you can even see in the vegetative development how much, how much more vegetation we're actually looking at there. So, um, so you'll see the, the, the clones on the left of both of those pictures were treated, whereas the clones on the right were not. Um, so it's just, you know, there's a lot more plant material there and, and hardiness um, is another feature there. 
Um, and, and the product that they actually used was this pretty actual organic. And the reason why we went this route was because I really like to see uh, humic and fulvic acid along with the seaweed extract in a transplant solution. The Ferdiactyl Organic has all of those um, along with um, some other root stimulants that will help um, improve the rooting and shooting functions of the plants. Those are all hormonal conversations that take place within the plant, um, but all of those things speak directly to whether or not that plant is going to um, hang on and, and get through that stress of transplanting. So I like to see, see a little bit of that in, into the mix there. Um, Piper, would you mind just popping in? I don't have a way to monitor my time right now with the way I'm set up here. So um, can you give me a little five minute warning of some kind? And, and uh, Absolutely, you're at, you're at 15 minutes left. <laughs> okay, perfect. All okay. right. Um, so one of the concerns that I have when you're transplanting um, it is sometimes we get going a little bit too fast and we run into challenges that we don't see until three or four or five days after we've transplanted. Um, so one of the ways to overcome that, again, like I mentioned, use a transplant um, system that has a water wheel and along with some type of biostimulant. I really like the seaweed extract um, because of the uh, glycine patane that we have in that uh, for the organic will help to overcome the stresses that the cells undergo when we do transplant. Um, and, and then also ensure that the starts are firmly in place. The picture that you see on the left um, was, was a start that unfortunately they were going just a little bit too fast and they weren't able to get a good press. So when they dropped it into the hole, it wasn't getting a good firm fit. Um, the plants were a little bit too tall and it was kind of tipping them to the side. And so, you know, we came back to the field the next day to do some observations and we saw a lot of these plants leaning to the side. And so um, some of them we were able to save by going back through and just pressing them down and firming them in the hole. Uh, one that you see right here was one that we weren't able to save and it had succumbed to the stress and then not having access to soil. It wasn't enough contact with enough soil there to be able to catch and, and be okay. Now the transplant on the right is a little bit different. That one went into the ground just fine, but it actually got a little bit too much water. They had planted into a wetter soil, and then after planting, they immediately turned on the irrigation. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the tips of the leaves actually have uh, a little bit of brown on the end and are showing some nutrient deficiencies. In fact, it's not a nutrient problem, it's a little bit of overwatering problem. Um, so don't get carried away with putting out too much water once you're planted. Um, let Mother Nature do its thing and just keep a, a, a steady bit moisture balance, but not an overwatered scenario. Those are two or three common pitfalls that I really saw a lot of people struggle through last year. So we're going to now talk a little bit about weed management as it relates to our pest management plan. Um, so weed control is a really important consideration on how you're going to manage your crop through the whole season. Weeds can rob the water, they can rob nutrients, um, but they also have some other functions like bringing in other beneficial insects into the system to feed on those things. So um, we constantly are in this balance of do we want weeds or do we not want weeds? Should we cover crops? Should we not cover crops? Um, I would say that a couple of things that you could do will help to um, improve your chances of a better outcome. First of all, tilling 24 to 72 hours right ahead of planting. That will help to eliminate those teeny tiny weeds that we can't see with our eye but have germinated and are viable. We really wanna be cautious of those. Um, and a little bit of fresh tilling will really help us with that. Um, making a seed bed is going to be very critical. We want the soil to be fluffy. We want the soil to be recept uh, a good receptor to our transplant when we move it into that. And um, so it's really important for us to do that. I see really great success using these raised bed systems. You can use biodegradable plastic. Um, or other things that would um, be able to shade out the weeds in the row. So that'd be in between your plants. Um, and that is, that's going to keep the weeds in, from in between kind of overtaking what, you, you know, what you're working to grow. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time for your hemp plants to shade out the weeds. So that's going to be really important. Another weed consideration is planting mature plants. Um, Transplanting immature plants with just a, a cotyledon set of leaves and one, one set of leaves, they're not big enough, first of all, probably to withstand the shock of transplant. But moreover, they're not going to adapt quickly enough to be able to shade out those weeds. So I really like to see four and even six set of branches. I can't plant a really tall leggy plant, 
But if I have something shorter in stature that has some branches, that's going to have a much better chance of shading out weeds and be strong enough and mature enough to withstand that transplant. Um, also, plant spacing and row spacing becomes a really big component of your weed control. Last year, I had growers doing all kinds of different variables of row spacing and in row spacing. So, for example, I told you that I kind of liked that, um, you know, 20, 2,000 to 2,500 final stand for cannabinoid production. Why I like that is because that gives me somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40 to 45 inches in between plants in the row. And then that gives me up to about 60 in between the rows. So I have the ability to straddle the rows to run a sprayer or a tractor through for the early part of the, se the growing season. Um, or I'll space out my rows so that I can actually reach over several rows at a time on both sides of my tractor to do maybe a pesticide application or potentially a foliar application. Um, so when you're thinking through how many seeds or how many plants per acre do I want, I really am going to challenge you back to these cultural practice questions that we talked about earlier. What are you set up for to spray? That's going to be really important. How do you intend to manage the weeds? If you're going to plant a cover crop, chances are you'll need to mow once, maybe even twice. So am I, do I have enough space between my rows to be able to take a tractor with a mower of some kind in between there to keep the, the cover crops at a manageable level? Otherwise, they could get very tall and become like weeds and compete against my plants. So those are some really important considerations. And that's a very integrated you know, conversation to have. That's why we call it integrated pest management. Other pest management strategies that you may need to look at um, are oriented to um, bug and, and disease management. Um, some of our native predatory pests um, have, have been really interesting. Um, I was able to source several different times last year um, predatory pests where we actually released them into the field to manage for certain things. We had um, some really intense aphid infections. We had um, a russet mite infection in a farm. Um, but what I found was actually rotating modes of action of preventative, proactive, essential oil-based applications was our most effective, most cost-effective, and most plant-beneficial um, approach to that. Um, one of my biggest concerns is um, a, a farmer having access to other pesticides that aren't technically labeled for hemp, but maybe think because hemp falls under other crops that it might be okay. I want to tell you the label is the law and it's very, very important for you. If hemp is not listed as an approved crop for that material, please don't apply it. You can cause all kinds of other challenges later down the road that might render your crop unusable and put you out of compliance for pesticide residues. We're growing medicine and we're growing something that's going into the human food chain. We don't want to be contaminating that with something that's outside of that realm, okay? Um, so that's all I'm going to say on that. But I did have some experience with this particular material last year and I have actually moved that into several of my consulting clients' cropping systems. Um, in, in utilizing this product. It's called All Per Plus. I absolutely love it. I've had a tremendous personal um, experience with that. I don't, I don't have anything to gain on recommending this per particular material. It's manufactured in Michigan. Um, it, is an, it is really a, a solid base of essential oils um, that will help to utilize um, utilizing the terpene system that already exists in plants to help manage for disease and help to attack soft body pests. So the, this is a great tool. It's completely pollinator safe. Um, it doesn't harm your ladybugs. It doesn't, it doesn't um, damage or cause inappropriate residues at the end of the season. And I can apply this all the way up through harvest. Um, so I can still protect my plants from things like botrytis and gray molds all the way on through later season by utilizing this on a proactive basis. These types of tools have very little efficacy to knock down an infection. So once you have an infection, it's gonna be very hard to get that under control. And I wanna be very transparent about that. This is a preventative product that you're going to apply about every two weeks through the whole entire growing season to help support plant health, um, the plant's natural ability to wart off these types of diseases and pests, and then the materials and compounds within this material specifically affect and, and cause these bugs, bodies to dry out, 
um, and, and to, leave, to leave you alone. This is widely used in greenhouses and in indoor cannabis growing environments. And I'm really proud to be able to share a tool that I saw great results with on that particular um, thing there. So, um, so once we get into that early vegetative growth, we, we are gonna start doing some nutrient applications. I really like a foliar feeding, but I wanna caution you, you can't just apply everything all together. Sometimes nutrients applied together can cause antagonistic um, things. Like for example, if you apply phosphorus along with magnesium, you can actually cause lockout. Um, you can cause your tank mix to go bad on you. Um, there's other nutrients that just don't play nicely in a tank and don't play nicely when the plant is trying to take them in and they interfere with that. So um, if you apply them together or in excess of one another, you can run into those problems. Um, I really have, um, I really like to share with people the benefits of using seaweed extracts um, to help with nutrient uptake and translocation. Um, this isn't just a seaweed smoothie. Um, I, I really tech, truly hate those products because they, they, I don't feel that they bring a ton of value and I have very variable results with that. Um, however, I have had some really solid results with companies that are actually using um, specific molecules extracted from the seaweed to do certain functions like translocation. Um, so just because a product has seaweed in it does not mean it will do anything special. So please be cautious against the snake oils of the world. World. Um, the traditional commercial fertilizers, um, you know, are not bad to utilize in our in our system. But I really prefer to use a bioactive foliar base feeding system to enhance both the soil and the plant. If we have the opportunity to do both, why wouldn't we take advantage of that? Um, so that helps us to maintain our priorities of soil balance, which is gonna be really important. Um, so you're able to supply what the plant's needing while also supplying really high quality plant exudates to feed the mycorrhizae that are naturally in the soil or the other bacteria and fungi involved in, in water and nutrient um, flow back and forth with your plants. So and Christy, really quickly, you're at your yeah. five minute warning. Um, okay. Because I know that you have so much content rich slides coming, <laughs> I will give a caveat that we might run a little bit over time. Um, but just quickly, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming and that if you guys are interested, our next speaker is going to be RJ Hop, Director of Hemp Markets, Pan Exchange on July 1st. Um, is when we'll have our next webinar. So these webinars will be changed to a monthly schedule the first week of every month. He is going to present an insider's look into the hemp market. Um, so just help us get the word out. We really appreciate everyone's attendance. The word of mouth is the best way of marketing for us. Um, so please help us spread the word first week of every month, but I'll let Christy continue on. Um, feel free to duck out if you need to at one. If you'd like to stay, you're more than welcome to. So thanks, Christy. Thank you, Piper. So I'm going to talk just briefly on calcium. We, we, we talked a little bit about the calcium's role in helping to maintain stem strength, stalk strength, and cell elongation. Um, I've seen really good results with utilizing um, you know, calciums in the system. But again, not all calcium products are created equal. Um, so if there's ever a product that pops up that you want some you know, coaching on, I'm going to give you my contact info and you can reach out to me. I can just give you my opinion on it and, and you can do with it what you want. Um, but calcium is really important for us to, um, to firm fruit. Um, so in other cropping systems, adequate calcium is what helps to keep blossom end rot at bay for things like peppers and tomatoes. Calcium helps to um, get your honey crisp apples nice and firm and, and to prevent um, de defects in the fruit. So in our, in our hemping system, calcium actually speaks directly to robust and, and complete um, formation of floral material. So everything from trichomes to, to pistil and, and, and calyx and, and all the reproductive tissue there, the calcium is going to help to strengthen the cell walls to do that. Boron regulates the development of those cells. Calcium regulates the strength of those cells. Potassium is really important in regulating water flow within the cells. And so why that's really important is because potassium becomes um, a really critical uh, nutrient when we're undergoing things like drought stress. Uh, we want water to be able to translocate through um, from these teeny tiny root hair roots all the way through the plant to be able to do its function. We can't do photosynthesis without water. So we have to do, we, we, we want to make sure we have adequate potassium, but not too much potassium. Um, so that's, you know, as we move through the season, we're going to just 
tapered down our nutritional applications or, you know, kind of tailor those to fit where we want to, we want to have that. Um, so when we approach, you know, somewhere in that week, eight to week 10 of after planting is when we should really start to see, it may happen sooner in some geographies, but by week eight for sure, we should start to be able to see our first signs of sexual orientation of the plants, whether that be male pollen sacs or whether that be flower, um, your calyx, um, which is going to have very distinctive markers, and that's where all the good stuff's gonna start to be created. Um, so boron plays a critical role in cell association with reproductive cells. And so that means we wanna have boron in the system and available in the system prior to that happening. So I like to take an approach between week six and seven to start doing small doses of boron application to kind of start to tweak and make sure we're supplying that um, so that we can have what we need there. Um, sorry about that, my screen just popped out. Um, so, so that boron application will support the transition of the plant also from vegetative state to reproductive state. And so that's really critical. That's one of those really important nutrients that if applied at the right time, we can really make a huge difference in our yield and our plant quality and our CBD quality at the end of the season. Um, so at that kind of point, we're gonna start to do a lot more field scouting. We're gonna be watching for disease, we're gonna be bug IDing, um, we're gonna be looking out for males and culling those as we find them, and also seeing how's our weed control plan working? Do we need to do more? Do we need to go out there with the hoe or a, a, some labor out into the field and manage for those things? It's gonna be very critical for you to do that, and really the only way for you to know is to actually be ground truthing. Um, I do a lot of field scouting here in Michigan, and the reason why I do that is because I wanna constantly be checking myself with these recommendations I'm making to say, are we doing the right thing, or do we need to turn that dial a little bit one way or the other? And that kind of pushes us off into the reproductive, you know, it, as we finish out um, the season in the reproductive, I really want to be watching for that. I want to cut the nitrogen back way, way back. Um, there's really no need for that. Nitrogen is primarily supporting vegetative growth. I want the plant to be associating its nutrients for reproductive growth. So I'm going to be looking at um, different things that might be small doses of phosphate, um, small doses of micronutrients and doing a foliar feeding approach along with my Alper Plus or um, whatever pest management tool I might need. We had a little bit of end of the season bud rot last year um, in Botrytis that kicked in, but that was mostly secondary to some hemp borers and European corn borers setting up camp in our, in our cannabis plants. Um, so we have very few tools against those particular critters. Um, we did have some success using Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, in a in an foliar application, um, but that has very limited. It's a very limited um, toolbox as far as managing pests at the end of the season when we're that close to harvest. Um, so just caution you against against that. So you know, as we're in this reproductive stage, we're just like I said, we're, we're our colas are going to be forming, which is kind of a, a slang term for. Um, flower clusters and they're going to be um, filling out and, and really getting robust and we're going to start to see trichome development and we'll start to see sugar crystals on the leaves and, and, and crystalline um, bodies being developed um, to start storing CBD for us. Um, so our water management at this point, the plant is going to be using a tremendous amount of water at the end of the season and so that's really critical and make sure you keep a close eye on your calcium sulfur and mag at this point. Um, we can really start to see um, failures of nutrient deficiencies earlier in the season are going to rear their ugly head at that point. Um, so I want to just throw this up at, in front of you. I don't know if these are, these are some terpenes that are found in hemp that we also find in other things um, in our daily life, things like lavender, black pepper, um, hops, and um, different citrus there. So, um, and, and we actually treat these particular crops like the pine, the lavender, hops, and citrus um, to generate very prolific terpene profiles using sulfur, calcium, and mag. Um, so this isn't just my idea. Um, this, is, is, this is actually a conglomeration of um, this map shows you where I, I was last summer um, in farms that I interacted with personally and helping to develop really solid recommendations that I'm sharing here with you today. Um, and I hope that this is a value to you. I'm here to be a partner for you in your field work and um, in, in interacting with a lot of different farms already this year. And I'll do what I can. Um, my schedule is filling up by the day, um, but I'm happy to be a resource there and um, just know that I'm going to push you towards 
um, you know, bioavailable nutrients. I'm going to push you towards um, solutions that work with the plant's nature and with the soil's nature. Um, that's, that is my approach and that's what I'm most passionate about. Um, but I'm here to be a resource for you and you're welcome to reach out to me and there's my contact information on this slide. I thank you for your attention today and you guys are a great audience and if we have a minute for questions, I can hang around and, and, um, and respond to those questions. So that's, that's it. Well, thanks, Christy, for your content-rich presentation. Does anyone have any questions that they want to type into the chat? So Richard says, do you have any experience with Texas hemp crops? Right, so Texas was just approved, which is really exciting, and I'm so I, I'm so happy for um, Texas farmers. Um, I personally do not have any clients growing hemp in Texas. I have some Texans that are growing hemp in Michigan, um, but uh, not the other way around yet. Um, but I am excited to have just recently been interacting with the temp, the Texas hemp growers, um, and um, and it sounds like um, they're interested in maybe doing something with me. So if that's the case and you want to advocate for me if you uh, that would be great um, if not I, I can uh, I can help answer questions as needed um, I also know of a couple of excellent cannabis consultants in that area um, that would be able to support you um, down that way great so it looks like we have another question Sarah says how do we fix a potassium deficiency so potassium deficiencies can be caused by a myriad of things um, so it's important for us to understand what's the trigger and what is causing the, the potassium deficiency. Um, occasionally, um, because of potassium's molecular charge, um, it plays a role in the soil saturation. And when that gets out of balance with calcium and magnesium or hydrogen, we can sometimes see a, like a locking out effect. And the way that we can overcome potassium deficiencies in, in some cases, not in all cases, but in some, um, is with foliar applications of things, of, of potassium products, um, that have a very small molecular structure that we can do multiple um, spoon feedings of. Um, we run into potassium uh, deficiencies typically in, in pH soils that are outside of the ideal range, and so that's how we overcome those particular issues. Sounds good. Well, just out of curiosity, when this is actually my own question, but when you were talking about you know, eight weeks is when you see sexual maturation. When you talk about time, do you talk about time from seed or do you talk about time from transplant? From planting in the field. Um, I, like to, I like to start the clock um, when we're into the field. Okay, um, so, so whether it's a seed or a clone, same, correct. same correct. time. Okay. Right, because these are photosensitive crops. Now, if I'm growing an autoflower, I have different parameters that are going to be associated with the autoflower. But growing a photosensitive crop, like we are outdoors, we're pretty much going to be under the same calendar for the most part here in the Midwest. We may be different by a week or so when we hit our 12-12 to trigger that. So right, up, right as we're descending towards 12-12 in our daylight is when we're going to start seeing the sexual expression initiated. And that's about that timing where I like to hit it with boron and, and to give, that, give it some support. Boron is highly mobile in the soil, and so unfortunately it's often subject to leaching. So I prefer to use a foliar treatment of boron to ensure that I'm apply, what I'm applying is actually getting into the plant. Excellent. Well, I know we're over time. If there's any other questions, feel free to message me in a private message and we can get Christy to answer anything else that you may have. Christy, thank you so much for that yeah, content rich right? information. And Absolutely. the PowerPoint presentations from Christy will be um, available online on the Midwest Hemp Council, the Purdue website, and actually more currently the Hemplet Farms website. So after today's session, we'll be moving, like I said, to a monthly webinar frequency. Um, and the next big speaker will be RJ Hoff, the Director of Hemp Markets for the Pan Exchange um, on July 1st. So he'll give us an insider's look into the hemp market and the economy. So like I said before, the word of mouth is the best way to spread everything around. Um, we could really use your help in getting the word out about these webinars and keep us going. So thank you for joining us for today's session. I'm Piper Halpin reminding you to join us the first Wednesday of every month. <laughs> thank you guys.